you. Um, I would like to open tonight's uh, event with a quote, a quote by a famous uh, philosopher, Hannibal Smith, and let me sh make sure that I get this right. Um, I love it when a plan comes together. And this is absolute an adequate way to describe this year's festival. Um, also, the planning of tonight's closing night felt like that. Yesterday, our guest, Jason Scott, was in Brussels. Tomorrow, he will fly back to the US, and today, he is here. Going out of his way, although Utrecht, on the way from Brussels to, Utrecht, to Amsterdam Airport, is not really right of his way, out of his way, but we're very glad to have him here. We have to thank Aymal in Brussels for sharing Jason Scott with us. Thanks for Aymal. I'm sure they're watching our stream, so. Um, I already explained the structure of the festival a bit. Within the three sub-themes, we have three temporal lenses, past, present, and future. Um, the five keynotes that we have in the festival operate as a kind of a series of free radicals going um, separate from these temporal lenses. And I think free radical is an absolute um, adequate way to describe Jason Scott. He himself describes him as a free-range archivist. Um, he will be interviewed tonight by um, Friso Viersum. Uh, he's the moderator for tonight. After the keynote speech, Friso will interview him. Uh, Friso Wiesem is a philosopher, curator, working amongst others for Expodium and Hacking Habitat. Please a warm welcome for Friso Wiesem and Jason Scott. Well, let's see if that on still works now. Hope it's nothing to do better. Uh, welcome everybody at the diehards of the festival for the, the closing evening. Uh, Jason promised he'll give a very upbeat talk, which I think he's going to do maybe in a singing way, if we are very uh, much asking for this. Jason Scott had a funny accident when he was seven. He was born in 1970, so in 1977 something happened. He's going to address this in his speech that made him have a great interest in technology and computers. Um, that evolved into him being an archivist, as Ion said, historian of technology, a filmmaker. Jason started textfiles.com, which archives the old bulletin board systems, which you perhaps have used in your younger days. Uh, the filmmaking process started when in 2005, the movie BBS, the documentary, came out. After that, he continued, and he's now working for the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine, and he's a very regular speaker at the Deaf conferences, so he's used to speaking for audiences just like do. Without uh, much further ado, Jason, stage is all yours. This thing working? Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that's great. All right, all right. Give me my test pattern. There we go. Anyway. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out for this. Some of you have traveled a bit of a ways. Other people have no idea what they're up to against. They're just sitting through different things. Some of you might have seen a film that had me in my terrible home I live in, in upstate New York. Um, but either way, I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, this talk, I tend to be a little bit full of profanity. I'm a little strange. I make connections that aren't obvious. Uh, for the people who care about such things, I am not an uh, academically trained archivist, so you can walk out now. I am a uh, self-taught everything, so in that way, if you hear something misused or a term, that's why. Um, so. The talk is called, Help Will Not Arrive in Time. It's a positive outlook at the world and the way we live in. Um, so my name is Jason Scott, like I said, and there's usually two different reactions to that. Um, if you are in the bottom set, um, I'll tell you a little bit, of, like they said, about what I am about. Uh, let's go really quick on this. I work for the Internet Archive at archive.org, which some people think of as the Wayback Machine, and other people think of as that really huge pile of weird stuff that I occasionally get linked to. Um, it's located inside of this building, which was purchased because it looked like the logo, no joke, and it, it has a beautiful interior. Inside, it's a church, and it actually has the servers quietly up in the corner, humming away. Each one of those is about two petabytes, each one of those towers. Uh, we have about 26 petabytes right now. The program is off, but what can you do? It's now 26, which is fine. It was 20 earlier this year, so we're growing. Uh, we like acquiring data. I've been working there since 2011, and if you work there for three years, they build a little statue of you. Here's me. 
So uh, if you work, as my boss says, we don't have stock options. So eh, he makes a little terracotta warrior of you. And mine is clutching software to his heart. And he has wings because he is the angel of death. Um, my boss, I just want to take a quick moment to mention him. His name is Brewster Kale. He's considered an internet hero because of the work he did. He made a lot of millions uh, off dot-com stuff. And instead of building a, a ship out of foie gras and caviar and then sailing it you know, across the desert plains, he decided he would make a library. And this guy's in there at 8 in the morning, working till 8 at night. To make books and information and knowledge be available for free to everyone he possibly can reach, like that's amazing to me, and I never get tired of it. But there was this one weird moment that captured for me perfectly like why I love working for this guy. To do what you have to understand about prat keeping. All right? So in the movie Jurassic World, which just came out, it stars a person named Chris Pratt, and there's a part when he's trying to train three vicious dinosaurs, who are obviously CGI replacements. But he struck this pose, and they didn't know it, but he became kind of a hero to zookeepers and the way they live. So zookeepers started to imitate this look, and it became known as prat keeping. And so they were just setting anything up they could. And I was like, and, and I mean, this was happening very quickly, like within a day or two. And I went to my boss, and I said, we got to do something. And he's like, what is this? And he has no idea what the movie is, what the reference is, why anyone would care. But I'm like, trust me, it's really funny. And with no context, he let me drag him upstairs to the servers and take this picture. <laughs> that is a fantastic amount of trust to put in somebody, to say, do this, and I swear to God, it's hilarious. And he did it. So thank you, Brewster. And Brewster trusts me in so many different ways. Sometimes it's a weird frowning look on his face, but you know, he mostly trusts me. So here's some of the things I do. I have a thing called the Internet Arcade. Uh, we have been able to port emulators to JavaScript, which means that we can open up computers in your browser window without any sort of plug-in. It just works. And it crushed our server. If you look up there, you can see the special moment when I decided to loose this on the world the system went, ow, okay, I'm thinking, no, how about, no, no. And then this is right here, I know this, because this is Ralph Muin uh, working very hard in the network team to go, I think I know what the, no, I don't, I think, no, and then we figured out what the problem was. <sighs> Turns out the problem is don't use non-compressed ping files, because then you send 156 megs per person instead of three, sorry. Um, but I also do things involving software of a physical nature because we have all of this bit rot going on where we have lots and lots of floppies. So I love to get my hands on floppies, image them, and get them up immediately. So I want to take it from that to that. I'm trying to take physical parts of this because I'm trying to close the air gap as fast as possible. And I want to have just a whole bunch of floppy images because now I can boot them instantly in a browser. So I'm working on this all the time to get things like this, to get weird shareware collections that just boot. And I didn't take these screenshots. A machine took these screenshots. And there it is for the Atari. There it is for the ZX Spectrum. And then here's me with the CDs of uh, Walnut Creek, which was one of the larger collections of CD-ROMs, just to rip them all, put them all online. Where they are right now, we have about 10,000 CD-ROMs up on archive.org. Don't know what's going to happen, but they're some level of safe. These are AOL CDs. And then you go, why? Why would you do that? AOL is America Online. It was one of our great tragedies. Um, but it was our attempt to turn uh, the internet into fast food. Um, and because they had to constantly get people to sign up for it, they decided to send out a lot of CDs. Like, half of all manufactured CDs in the world were AOL CDs for a couple years running. So I consider that part of history. So I asked people for them, and I'm being sent hundreds of CDs in the mail. Somebody else decided that he uh, would save a very odd object. He worked in a supermarket, or I should say more like a department store in America called Kmart, which is short for Kresge Mart. And he noticed that their monthly announcement tapes 
uh, were for each, each individual month, it would say, oh, here's the July 1990 tape. And they would play it for a month and then throw it away. And he would throw it away into his apron. And so he ended up with a pile of them. And what are you going to do when you have all of these things? Why well, you put it on the Internet Archive. So the Attention Kmart Shoppers Collection went up, and I helped kind of make it work within our system. So my part in it was to work with him and be his concierge. And I'm a lot of people's concierges where they have things and they want them up, but how do you get it going? And so I'm that voice that says, oh, here's the script we'll use, here's the piece. And we end up with a lot of views, a lot of views. This is 292,000 people who listen to it in six days. Six days, why? Um, <laughs> It got mentioned on our public radio about the history of it. And people heard that story and said, would you like some of the reel to reels from the 70s? Sure. So now those are up. And um, I'll come back to this, but the people who had these in their garages saw no value in it, but weirdly didn't throw them away either. And then suddenly there's this thing called the Internet Archive and there's this collection called Attention Kmart Shoppers and suddenly it had value or at least persistence or at least somewhere to give it away. You know, the joy people have of throwing something out into the hands of a willing and happy archive uh, is legion. I love getting that conversation going. And there have been 1.1 million listens of Kmart music in about a week and a half. Not my job to figure out why. I do know it has an amazing effect in social media, and you have people who are just confused. Here's how I found out that I'm very old. Uh, here's the moment when you find out you're old. There is a genre of music called vapor wave. Uh, so, so there's a genre of music called vapor wave, and vapor wave is kind of an homage done by um, young musicians to 1980s commercialism. Okay. And it said, <laughs> when, I, when I noticed that these were being tagged as Vaporwave, I said, okay, when did Vaporwave start? And it was listed as the early 2010s, and that it was a derivative of Sea Punk and Witch House. <laughs> and I went, I know none of this, I am dead. I'm dead, I'm gonna go sit in this hole and just put dirt on me and wait. But I love that this is the guy's life right here, making Jolly Rancher vodka and listening to early 90s Kmart in-store music. Mm. Anyway, I also helped co-found an activist archivist group called Archive Team, the A-Team. And it was started because there was this overriding anger and sense of helplessness about services shutting down. Now, I don't mean something like, I put up launder cats, you know, the, the laundry service for cats.com, and I was selling it, you know, cat cleaning services, and then, oh, nobody wants that, and I go away. It was more where people would start these services that were meant to include the people, and it would obfuscate from them the process by which their history and culture and writings were being created, and then they would announce in a usually unbelievably perky letter why they were going away, and all your stuff was now gone. And that sense of helplessness struck me very, very deeply. And so I said, there should be a team of people who set foot into the site when it's closing and grab everything because the discussion about whether or not a building should be saved ends when they demolish the building. This happens more than once. And the archive team has stepped in a lot of different weird places. Now some of these you can have personal judgments about their value to the ongoing you know, survival of, of humankind. You know, I mean, and, and you are heavily, heavily excused from knowing all of these. These are some doomed services. Right? I mean, um, you might know about hives when it went away uh, in a blaze of 
terribleness, but you can also be forgiven for not knowing what Punch Fork was, which was a food blog service. Posterous may have not made it much over here. Let's not go into Pomf. Ink Blazers is a comic site. Each one of these were sites that had, in some cases, millions of accounts, and then said, based on blank, we're gonna be going down in blank, and you can blank, and blank was almost always fuck off. <laughs> and because of that, archive team would set in with these vicious, vicious sets of machines and go after it. A distributed preservation of service attack. The idea being that we would put up all this equipment and run things like the archive team warrior, which is a virtual machine that then connects to these and, and methodically downloads all of the contents forward facing. We don't hack, we just inspect closely. <laughs> and so, we would be able to do things like this archive bot where we can go after individual smaller sites very quickly. And as you can see, this 100% volunteer run project is a powerful low orbiting ion cannon able to absorb sites like they were nothing. Here's the pipeline for this thing. And you can see these weird numbers of how many gigabytes and terabytes are free, how much is ready you know, in terms of percentage-wise, ready to grab this stuff down. It's unbelievable to me. And this thing, again, 100% volunteer that people have done. We have probably about 15 to 20 active members working on specific things, and then about 100 other people who are either contributing clients or getting involved in projects in various ways. It is a wild success. And it's now it's roughly in its sixth or seventh year. Um, I'm not always there. Sometimes I find out a project finished without ever having heard of it in the first place. <laughs> they don't stop. You just look at some of these numbers, like 43 gig. Uh, anyway, so this is, by the way, what it looks like from the point of view of going after one site, in this case, Gamefront, may, long may they wave, um, where you can see up here the amount of material being grabbed, and this is our leaderboard, because young people love leaderboards. Vantech is winning the download. Um, and over here, this scrolls like nobody's business. And you can see these numbers as it's grabbing individual files from a very large collection of historical game files, shareware, patches, um, screenshots, demos, and they're grabbing them and then putting them into the Wayback Machine. Just recently, I had a situation where somebody called me to inform me that there was this warehouse. Hey, virtual web guy, did you know there's a world out there? Yes, so I went into this warehouse where they told me, here's a bunch of manuals, and we're gonna throw them out. Do you want them? Do I want them? They were beautiful, they were absolutely beautiful things. Um, they dated back, in some cases, to the mid-40s, um, they were based mostly around test equipment, so we would say oscilloscopes, radio electronics, things like that. And I was like, yes, who wants to help me? And when I went there, I went there on a Friday, and I said, when do you intend to throw this out? And they said, Wednesday. So I put out the word, and on Monday morning, we had these people, just people, just folks, come and help, and we paid thousands of dollars for boxes, and people had to make the boxes and cut them out. Um, and we ended up with piles of manuals. And, and bear in mind, we had to go through and take each unique one because we wouldn't be able to take everything. So we took one unique one. We think it's between 50,000 and 75,000 manuals. Um, we ended up with 1,600 banker boxes full of manuals. And we then did what you should do, which is stop letting the geek sort and hire the movers. So the movers showed up and they were ready for us. <laughs> and they put them for us in a couple of storage units where they are right now to this day. And I am now working with various archives to get copies off to it and see about scanning these and so on. And as they promised, that after our two days of cleaning it out, this is what it ended up looking like. So, it was a lot of weird things that I've been involved in. And I thought, well, I guess we're gonna have to formalize that too. And as someone suggested, I created Archive Core, 
which is now 700 people strong, scattered among the world, ready through a mailing list to run to a site to save it in physical space. So I have an army. Also, uh, because of the manual thing, I think I'm in the top 20 manual dealers in the country. I'm now that too. What the fuck is wrong with me? What is my deal? And this is really what I want to talk about today. I just gave you a lot of slides with a guy humble bragging his way through a weird digital life. And that's very interesting on its own. But I don't think that talks should be that, right? I think talks should try to inform you. And I think they should give you things that you can take home. I mean, it's interesting, I suppose, if you are a Jason Scott fanboy and you want to, they're almost always boys, and you want to um, like go like, I got to sit and listen to him ramble like he does online in person. Mm, and the food was delish. I feel like if you come to a talk and you spend 40 or 50 minutes with someone, you should have tools that maybe the person has either crafted themselves or that they have opinions on that you can then use in your life. And the theme of this conference has been various aspects of history, past, present, uh, future, and time, and temporal feelings. And I, I work in that. I live in that. And my relationship to it is where we, we come from, right? So, there's the mission. And what he was referencing just a moment ago was something happened at seven. The thing that happened specifically at seven was that I got my first home computer, which was a Commodore PET from my father. And I started, and there, I have two siblings. I became the sibling who got paler, and they became the siblings who got tans. So I loved that machine. I used it a lot. And when I was nine, um, I was, well, the term they would use now is parental abduction. And that means that when my parents got divorced, my mother took me without telling dad that little detail of where the kids were going. So there was an unpleasant month in the family. And don't worry, nobody got hurt. Uh, dad lost a lot of weight looking for us, but he did find us. Um, but the thing is, is that in the moment when my mother decided to make a run for it, um, unjustifiably, by the way, so. But, but uh, she said, take what you need, which is an incredible question for a nine-year-old. What do you need when you're nine? Turns out I need a blanket and a puppy. So I took my puppy and I took my blanket. Uh, but that moment was the most important lesson that I got when I was very young, which is you can't depend on anything persisting. The, the couple that created you is gone. The place where you lived, you may never be coming back to. And all the things in your room that you built into this vision of what is you will go. And that's the lesson, the unfortunate lesson, that set me on the career of always recognizing that everything around me was transient and always trying to ask, what can I do to help this persist? So when I started to use computer bulletin boards, I started to collect everything I got from them. All of their printouts, uh, uh, text files that I really liked, um, software that I used to drive things. Where I could, I kept the machinery. So when I started textfiles.com in 1998, it was just because I had it in a pile of disks that I had kept from when I was young, which not as many people did. So all that stuff came back, and suddenly I discovered I was a historian. I was a documentarian. And the same thing happened when I got into films was that I realized that all the people who had made bulletin board systems were going to begin to die. And so I should really interview them. And that became the, the, the uh, eight-episode BBS documentary series and the uh, two-DVD uh, Git Lamp set, which was on text adventures, because if you're going to do bulletin boards, why not do something even more obscure? I did a text adventure documentary in high definition. What are you going to do? And so the mission became save what you can, present it back to people so they enjoy it, and continue to teach people about what's important to save and, and, and treating what people have with respect, because it may be all they have. Everything I've done has been that. Once I realized that, and I did not realize this, let's not, 
Let's not pretend I'm self-aware to that level. It took me into my 30s to figure out what was going on. Um, but that mission drove me. So everything I've been doing has been towards that mission. So when I joined up with the Internet Archive, I found the, a collector bigger than me and went to work for him. So I work for the larger collector. Maybe one day we'll both work for an even larger collector. But the thing is, is that was my mission. How do I make that happen? I'm not too weird, but I definitely will take the cynical view. I don't have much trust in companies like Google and Facebook to ever do the right thing or to ever act like they've ever done the right thing. I can enjoy the results of Twitter, but I can never in my heart really pretend that what Twitter is doing is, is in any way nice. Oh sure, you can meet an occasional person working there and they'll be all nice, but I mean that's a story long old as time is the nicest person on the pirate ship, the pleasantest person to talk to in the gang. But I have very little faith in the commercialization of the human experience, the, the social experience turned into a commodity. I have none, and I don't think we're gonna do the right thing by it. So I look at it with kind of a real skepticism. I enjoy the fact that people interact, but I walk away from it saying, what's gonna happen when Zuckerberg has his little divorce from us and asks us what we are and what we need. The inertia and the friction comes from the fact that when I talk like I do, which I'm doing right here, I get a lot of this. And people tend to kind of jump in on things uh, and tell me that they're, you know, things are wrong, that what are you doing, how can you use phraseology like that. And the tools that I've built up is to prove things by action, is to prove things by getting things done. Um, projects that I've started where people have said that's impossible, I go ahead with anyway. The emulator and the browser didn't work for two years. That was two years of sending volunteers into the mines trying to figure out if it was even possible. But they believed in it because I said, whatever we produce will be open source. Whatever we do, we will turn computer history into an embeddable object. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? And they were like, yes, yeah. That's how I'm gonna waste the next six months. <laughs> and they did, they did. Uh, there, there was, there was a, a gentleman named Devisain who spent six months working on this project and had no guarantee it was possible. Like literally no guarantee, like nothing said this was gonna be possible. And then the day that he and his collaborator, Justin, were able to create a, 14, a, a ColecoVision running a Smurf game at 14% of normal speed, it was a day to remember. I remember where I was standing. I was in Texas, and I was looking at a machine, and they sent me a URL, and I said, what's this? And I heard the Smurf theme horribly in a window from people who were just believing. And then there were people who came along and said, well, if that's possible, you're doing it wrong, let me make it better. And we kept working on it, and, and we gave everything away. And it's been fantastic ever since then. Um, I get people, I, I, I'm confronted all the time, and I'm confrontational. And that's not for everyone. I, maybe that's not your approach. But I like to get in faces. I like to understand who people are. And I like to interact with them because people are what make these things happen, not scripts, you know, not filters. You can't build something and just drop it, you know? And you drop it on a crowd and you say, look, I just was able to connect MongoDB to this Twitter API and I'm done here, thanks. I feel like there needs to be a narrative, a story that people are involved. And if you're working on a project and you're finding people aren't helping you, may I suggest a narrative, a story, a reason, a, a belief? And if people say it can't be done, then ignore them and keep going because that's how I have been able to do this all this time. That archive bot is, I mean, I'm just scratching the surface when I describe it to you. I mean, the work these guys have done is amazing. They've created a language. It's got a language in it that lets you define how it will interact. Is this a video site? Should I be pacing it out so they don't catch me? 
Should I be combining these sites and all these different names into one collection? What should I do? Like, and it's all just volunteers hit with the mission, the belief, ignoring the haters, ignoring the haters. I love this because this really just captures my life. Uh, I, I think I'm gonna get it framed. I don't know who made it. I have to find him and, and, and get this framed. This just makes my, uh, anyway. And also, finally, or I should say fundamentally, is the moment. The moment. The moment is the life we're living right now. The moment is now. The moment is me here enjoying Utrecht and having been in Brussels yesterday and going on a beautiful date to Mons and seeing Bruce, uh, Bruges and, and just going places and seeing them and not turning everything into an abstract. So when I worked for the Internet Archive, it's very easy. The Archive is a technologically oriented group. They always want to send a script somewhere instead of a person because that's how a, a, a small team of 60 to 80 people, and that's everybody in the headquarters, is able to do as much work as they do. It's a $12 million a year organization. Uh, the fact that it's not funded every year to the hilt drives me insane. That, that this organization that does so much, I mean, almost every person I bump into has some experience with the Wayback Machine bringing back a memory. And uh, the, the, the moment can be one of thinking about the scripts, but I think of it as all the people who set foot on the archive virtually every day and what part of their lives it plays. Whether it's a memory from a thing they've never seen before, you know, that they dreamed could exist and it turns out we have a copy, or a game they've never played, or a game they've played. I've had cases where parents or um, young people with kids play with those kids games that we've put up that they themselves played. Or the, the, the gentleman who wrote me to say, I played this video game with my father when I was eight, and I was able to call him up and we were able to play it together again. It's those moments. It's the moment we have here that we're alive, right? Because this is what's waiting for us. And unfortunately, this is what I have on my mind all the time. This is how I earned the nickname, the Angel of Death. Because I'm there when the startup promise fails when the, 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 the emotionally and ethically bankrupt tech startup world leaves you. Uh, when they leave photographs for young mothers to find out were deleted two years ago. Or I've got army veterans who died and their, their, their widows can't get the password, so they're never sent the email that says the stuff's going away. Or when you can have Facebook decide, here's what the rats are moving in today, and they'll just move a menu item or invent a new idea, like today you're getting sort of an emotion button. I've decided that you can't see these friends. We're doing a small social experiment, hope you don't mind. It's that refusal to look at what's going on in the moment that we get too focused on history and we get too focused on the future because that's what we're all in, I guess you would call it, employment of, right? We're employment of what the future is going to be. And we're in employment of what the history used to be. And we are holding that mantle for both the generation to come and for the generation that went past. And I believe in them. And I wouldn't keep primary source material. Um, but I'll, I'll, we were discussing this before. I, I had this very strong belief that sometimes people say, oh, this is going to last a thousand years, like the Long Now Foundation. And that's a folly. If you've ever been at the opening or what has ever come of a time capsule, it's not pretty. They, stuff comes out moldy. You discover crazy stuff in there that nobody would want in a million years. Uh, you find that things are just this whole idealism and that the time capsule was actually for the people in the moment of burying the time capsule to forget how short their time on Earth is. That's the thing that really gets to me. And so, the tool that I hope I give you here is to say, you know, you, you should respect the past. If we don't have the past, then we do live in an eternal present without a past or a future. And people can manipulate what we were and claim what we are now. No question. And you should definitely pay attention to the future. Come up with ideas. They're going to be all wrong. But it's a good practice. 
I mean, if you could imagine that everybody was going to hold a cell phone up to celebrate everything all the time, I don't know. I mean, I, you knew that they were going to use cell phones, but you didn't know they were going to put little TVs on them and they would become the dominant way for many people to interact with the entire world, even when they're walking outside. But here we are. It's a good time. At the end of the day, you're going to be in this situation of having done work. And I believe in the work I've done, and I believe in the work that's out there. And the history that I've worked on, and I'm happy to discuss specific parts of what I've done, um, you know, I'm proud of them. I'm proud of the people who are in this room who work for Archive Team. I'm proud of the people who watch me on the stream. I'm, I'm happy with, to, to meet people who maybe learn something about how fragile our web ecosystem is. And that this was all, as was said in the movie you saw, if you saw it, I said that mankind made a huge bet. And this bet is very dangerous to say, we'll give you instant information everywhere about everything we can, but when we destroy it, or let it leave and die, it will be destroyed utterly and there will be no record it ever existed. Place your bets. That's, that's where we are now. Um, I'm going to keep that fight going. I'm going to keep uh, believing in what I believe in. I'll play the games. I'll save the history. I'll bring the bits. I'll bring it all together. And I hope what you do means that much to you at this moment. That where you're working, I took a 60% salary cut to work at the archive because I believed in it so much. It's the best money I've ever spent in my entire life. Every single waking moment, I'm doing what I want to do. It's, it's, it's a dream life uh, and it's to do the thing I care about. And I hope whatever you're working on brings you that much joy. I hope that every moment you have has as much joy and I thank you for spending some of these moments with me. Thank you. Let's, let's do this. Let's. Yeah. Can we take one piece? Not whatever you'd like. I'm, I'm happy to take this mic. Uh, boom. Wow. So, first of all, I suppose uh, you made some people very enthusiastic in this room, including me. I hope so. Where can or, we line or, up? Or, 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 we talked about this. Or they're like, what the fuck was that? Shall we just have a little look? Who's the people would say, what the fuck? What the fuck was that? Oh, not bad. Okay, one what the fuck. One? One what the fuck. All All right. Right. So then, for those people having been uh, very much uh, enthusiastic by your story, where can they line up for being in your archive corps? Say it again? Where can they conscript themselves to your archive corps? Like, what, what, do, what do they, do they want to play a part in it, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, if they want oh. to volunteer. So, archiveteam.org has a ways to download the client if you want to just become an archive team warrior. And that's where you basically run a program on your machine inside of a little virtual instance. Your machine can do other things. And it will be asked to help with projects we're working on. And so you're able to help, but you don't have to learn a lot of technical stuff, or more importantly, you don't have to constantly sit around wondering what to do next. It will assign you. We, we used to call it archive at home, uh, similar to SETI at home, where you were sharing machine space. So we have a few people who, <laughs> let's just say that they, we have a guy, who I won't call him out, who has essentially hijacked the entire ISP he works at to help archive team. It's, it's our weapon. It's like, it's like when Batman opens up his thing and goes, yeah, did I mention I have an entire nuclear reactor? <laughs> he has opened up a thousand machines on a job. And when I watch that, I'm just, I guess I'm supposed to feel a little ashamed, but I'm more like, it is glorious! Oh my God! And, and the relationship with these organizations, these, these organizations that are shutting down, we just had one that we're all wringing our hands over. Um, because they announced essentially on Monday or Tuesday that they were closing today. And their definition of today was zero colon zero today. And so they gave everybody about five days. But don't worry, they mailed, stick with me, they mailed paper into envelopes with a stamp saying, we're going to shut down your site. 
to variant amounts of arrival. Some of them are still arriving. <laughs> Great job. Your car is being towed. Your car has been crushed. Your car is now a cube. Please move your cube. Just happened. So, wow. Yeah. And to continue on this line, were there any closed down websites that you were trying to archive that actually you couldn't archive because they really thought that it would be a bad idea for those stuff to still be around? So in terms of, you're saying, where have we failed? Mm -hmm. Oh. So the first one we were really involved in a big way with was GeoCities. Um, the archive team got the uh, collection that Olia and Dragon used, uh, Olia who spoke here. So when you see those um, GeoCities web pages out in that display, that came from our data set. And like the first time of anything, we didn't know what we were doing. Like we really didn't know what we were doing. Very similar, I might say, to that archive, that um, archive core load of the manuals. We did that wrong. I mean, the way to do it is to buy something called Gaylords. I don't know if you've heard of these. They're basically um, pallet-mounted bins called Gaylords. And what you do is you fill up a Gaylord and then forklift it into a truck. And in this way, you can move really quickly. You can just load that thing up, forklift it in. You could, we could have done the job in a fraction of the time. But we didn't know. And nobody was there, and we had 48 hours to make a decision. Same thing with GeoCities. We did it the best we could. The, us now, we laugh. We would be like, we could do it in two weeks. It took us about six months. Um, but we did our best in a dearth of other people doing things. Well, over time, we'll occasionally run into a site that goes out of its way to stop us. Um, they'll threaten us. They'll demand me to talk to them, and then we'll scream at each other. Um, and I mean, bear in mind, I mean, they're deleting everything. And they're like, stop it. And I'm like, no. They're like, you're costing us a lot of money. And I'm like, oh, man, really? I am having so much trouble dredging care out of Give a Fuck Bay because <laughs> you are deleting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of works by people by the, you know, just uh, with no warning. And we've, we've, we had one, it's not quite a failure, but it makes me laugh every time I think of it. The posterous was the one where they, the CEO told us to stop, like they tell us to stop. And we figured out we were crushing their servers and that they couldn't, they were, they were getting way too many downloads from us. And the CEO started threatening me and I started threatening the CEO back. And then I got, we got a quiet message on the back end from one of the engineers going, if you just stop agitating him and you stop insulting us, we will quietly give you a server. And it will just go to you and you can pull it down. And we went, okay. And it went. And it went for a while, but it got closer to the shutdown date. We still hadn't gotten everything. So we try to reach that engineer, and the engineer can't be found. So I said, turn it back all on again. And they showed up again within an hour, going, what are you doing? And we're like, we couldn't find your number. And ultimately, they kept the server going. For, while the CEO was publicly insulting me, they quietly left the server going for another month, I think. And um, they had been bought by Twitter. So the secret was Twitter intentionally knew they were going to destroy this. So we, some of the archive team members asked the engineer what his favorite kind of cake was. And it was chocolate chip or something. So I had a chocolate chip cookie cake made. And I stormed into the Twitter headquarters and demanded to see this volunteer, this engineer. And there's a picture of me like, Archive team made you a cake, and then I walked out. And that was just all around a mess, right? But meanwhile, there were seven million accounts at stake here. So all these shenanigans and circus antics and everything was in service of saving things. But, oh, uh, I mean, there's probably a few, like YouTube is about to delete a lot, a lot, because they want everyone to sign up to the new terms of service, and they will, turn off. 
I mean, I can't fathom how much is going to go away. That's too big for our archive team. We can't do anything. Like, we're, we're, we're doomed. We can't, we can grab the most popular things, which we do. Like, here's the ones that have more than 100,000 views so that probably it has some cultural value. But, but they're just going to shut off. I mean, years of video because they're like, well, you didn't sign up for our brand new service. So then before tears start welling up in your eyes, another question on a sad thingy. What, <laughs> what is something that you would have loved to save, perhaps even pre-internet, because for your mission to give back to people what gave fun to people so that they can actually have moments again having fun with that same material, what do you think is something that should have been saved? Well, um, there's a lot of online services in America like CompuServe and The Source that were like really the first progenitors of a lot of these things and they were, they were taken down. And I, I used to say they were my great lost holy grail, but even them in the interim, I think I found the guys who have them, who took them, so we might bring it back. If you can believe it, people are making an America online emulator to be able to run the old clients against. I, I can't justify that one, but, <laughs> but it's happening. So every time I get kind of despairing about, oh, maybe that's gone forever, it might be back. So actually, I'm pretty, believe it or not, pretty positive. So there's not really a great lost, we never saw it before, uh, Ah, uh, thing. I mean, I guess if you want to get really goofy, I would say I, I, the great, the first great world exposition of what 1865. Mm. Like we sort of know what it was like, but it was big. I would love to have a more vivid experience of what that was. So then we get to this second layer, actually, um, because before internet and before you are rescuing people, deleting stuff from internet. Uh, we had quite some history before, and a lot of parts from history are actually gone. Um, if we look, for example, very silly at uh, European history, where it took 1,000 years for a few documents to reappear during the Renaissance. Um, what else is lost? And then the question is, perhaps mankind is not so much more happy these days than in mankind was 2,000 years ago when the Romans were still sharing that knowledge. What would it mean if knowledge gets lost? Is historical amnesia perhaps not a very fast forward to a future where we have to think for ourselves and not be stuck to histories that, um, that actually keep repeating itself because we're doing silly mistakes all over again? Yeah, you're just trying to poke me. Um, the, the thing is, is um, and that's what we, you and I had a nice chat before this happened, and I was talking about how, to me, the fundamental my, again, layman mass communications degree, made some films, worked as a temp guy, opinion is that a lot of what we are doing is in service of the society that we are in 100 years. And that that society will look at what remains or what was passed to them and go, that was great, that sucks. Mm -hmm. Institutional racism, probably don't need that. Smoking indoors, not so hot on it. Um, a really cool way to build a table using no nails. I like that. I think I'll keep that. Vaccines, probably. You know, I mean, each one of these is passed on to that group, and they're going to make the decisions, and they're going to keep or throw out or suppress or, uh, you know, enhance things. So uh, th that's a different way of thinking than some because they're like, I'm making this for 500 years. And I'm like, no, you're really not because. 80 to 90% of that doesn't include you. And other people have completely different opinions. I mean, it's delightful when it does happen. I mean, there's, there's plenty of uh, these wonderful uh, historical cases where people are deriving value of an amazing sense. Um, the one that really sticks out to me is um, ship logs. They took ship logs and digitized them all, put in all the numbers, and in doing so, they showed where all the trade routes were. And you can see where which areas got the most mm. ships. But then right out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is, is this area where there's all these straight lines. Just straight lines, straight lines. And then it goes away. And it's like, what are those? And the answer is they're the doldrums. 
They're the parts where the trade winds give up and the ships would sit for two weeks and they would do all these uh, superstitious things. They would throw all the shoes off the ship. They would sing certain songs to try to get the trade winds back and then they would go. And by reading the logs, we can see precisely where the doldrums were and how they would affect these people. And that's to, they had to do like 2.6 million logbooks on all these entries or something like that. It was 2.6 million entries in logbooks. Like Which, that's, that to me is fascinating and wonderful and they could not have dreamed when they were using it. And some of the stuff we're generating, I mean, this whole, if you want me to be a futurist, this whole experience of us right now may be emulated for some reason by some teenager in a hundred years, just because they're like, look at this, I'm just running random symposiums to see if any good ideas come out of them. That would, you can sit there and say that's impossible, and I'm like, I don't know, symposium emulation, that'd be kind of fun. Which brings me to something else, which, which didn't come up in your talk, uh -huh. talking about those ship logs. Um, there was a book being published quite a few years ago by an American guy, Scott McKenzie, who read all these old ship logs, um, and he was especially interested in Chinese ship logs. Apparently, before the Europeans went out and conquered all the world, uh, it was the Chinese controlling all the seas and building colonies everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, now, he had to learn Chinese, of course, right. to read the ship logs and to try to redefine the routes that they were taking uh, to find out what shipwrecks they had to leave. How do you deal with internet in other languages than English? The archive team is very poor on that by my standards. We're really good at Japanese because of the number of anime fans among the archive team members. And we occasionally have people from non-English speaking countries outside of Europe but mostly it's Europe and US materials that get the most attention. Occasionally we'll find out that a Japanese site is going down and we'll go after it. And the archive bot, which enables us to do flyby grabs of sites that we think have cultural meaning, um, sometimes will link to things. That's how the archive team deals with it. The archive.org machines, they just kind of spray not too deep over the entire internet. That's a different methodology. So they don't go many links deep. They'll go like 20 or 30 links deep on a given site, but they'll, they'll do, hmm, I think it's something like a million links a day or something. I forget the exact number, but they're absorbing without any major um, sorting. Uh, it's very agnostic. So they end up with a lot of other sites in other languages and it, ton of porn and a ton of spam sites. And so they're just kind of going, what's here? And then later it turns out, oh, good work, you grabbed something. Um, the archive team's more of a laser. Um, but so that's one other method, which is just don't even ask, grab as much as you can. And we have compressed something like 16 or 18 petabytes of web history going back to 1996 as a result. And now you are talking about Google, Facebook, YouTube here. Uh, actually, yeah, I wasn't very nice, was I? Uh, no. Well, somebody else was pretty rush on them as well this week. Um, so they're archiving internet as a lot of people use it these days. Um, and they're gonna repurpose this for their own benefits, where mm -hmm. of course your work is for the benefits of the users. Um, would your work one day be not necessary because actually these big companies have saved everything, and we might just pay a little to get to the stuff that you are saving for free. Well, the homogenation of the internet makes certain kinds of archiving easy, and I did do a push recently with our team to say maybe we should start to round up what all the utilities are for scraping Facebook and scraping other services like that, just to have it, just because it's a tool that most people will use. Can I save my, my Facebook site? And, and try to encourage people to do it. Um, Unfortunately, for a lot of people, Facebook is the entire internet. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, I mean, I understand that, too. I mean, not everybody, some people just want to own a car. They don't want to open up the front of it. They don't want to deal with, like, juicing it up with a whole bunch of new add-ons. Even if it makes the car cooler, uh, they just want to get into it, go where they go, and drop it. I want to log in, tell everyone that I have a cat, and then I want to log off. 
Uh, or, oh my God, there's, you know, something happened to a Kardashian, and that worries me for a moment. And I have a very, 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 very poorly culled opinion I wish to put up. And then I'm going to go back to what I'm doing. And for them, that's an enjoyable internet. I, you know, and you can be sad, but you can also say, no, that's your happy life. You, you wake up and you go and you, you do that. It's hard to be judgmental. And Facebook feeds into that by producing this kind of faux social interaction that's been commodified, that feels like you are living a life through it. And for some people, they're happy. Um, maybe they don't need to be knocked out of the matrix. Um, but but uh, I don't... I, I, I actually am rather bullish. We discussed this in the brunch this morning. The tools that we're creating, that we have created in the, in the course of uh, putting all of life online as fast as we have, are immeasurably great, like one computer generation back. So you can get like a USB stick, uh, you know, a 30, uh, the, the, the line I used was a 32 gig USB stick can still destroy a, a company or a state. So we have a lot of like network protocol and technology and stuff that if somebody's like, nah, I'm just going to do my own private little thing, they can have a reasonably powerful thing. Uh, you can shoot with a camera for like $400 or less even that will shoot better than any television looked in the 90s now and shoot your thing and nobody's going to stop you and you're gonna film something awful or fantastic. So I kind of revel in that, that, that advantage. So as long as you don't convince yourself it's not useful unless it's hooked into the main internet and hooked into Facebook and has all of the, the, the prerequisites, you can have a pretty good time. Like it's pretty, you know, we get, we get some, you know, it's so much easier to do circuit boards and people just do amazing circuit boards, you know, and they're, they're, they're selling them and you're like, I can't believe anyone would ever have bought this. And there it is, you know? So believe it or not, for all of my pessimism, that's mostly because I'm like an ambulance. So I get to see the worst mm. at two in the morning, but I walk in the park and people are pretty happy. That's nice because happiness is your, your drive, as you have explained. Mm -hmm. Now, looking further into um, this, uh, this Google takeover, um, as I call it simply, and it's a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, Although now it's alphabet, don't forget that. Yeah. Now, they are having a narrative. Yeah. Uh, their narrative could be completely opposed to yours. They say, we want to store everything by the means that we want to store it, and in the end, you're going to be, the sucker was going to pay for regaining control over your own data. Right. Um, and your narrative, and I wrote it down shortly here, is to be alive and share moments alive. Yes. Um, now, that narrative, getting back to a, a little bit of historical thinking, um, I used to study history, and it told me if you have studied history a little bit, you're always walking towards the future, which you're backwards. So you're always seeing the past while not knowing what is going to be in front of or actually on, on the other side of you. Right. We don't know for technology, we know technology is going to be easier, it's going to be quicker, uh, we're going to have more tools at our p possibilities to, to use the internet a lot more. What is the narrative behind you, your mission to save everything? Would you like people to have happy moments after all, or would you like people to have happy societies after all? Right, well, so my mission isn't to save everything, and sometimes that comes off, because Oh man, if you saw my house, it looks horrifying. Um, but but the thing is, is it's it's less important to me to save everything than to give people the agency and the right to decide when they're going to save. And in doing so, there's these maneuvers we've done, some of them engineering marvels, to take the decision out of the hands of the company of what to do with third-party items and then keep them going. We get contacted by people saying, no, that was a good break point for me, just take it down and we'll do it. Um, but for a lot of people, we just get thank you saying, I didn't know that I even had a choice. I didn't even know how I was gonna get this stuff and you have it. And we get mail like that all the time. I think that if you wish to 
forget some of your past or forget who you are or forget where you came from because it benefits you. Um, you know, I talk about Ellis Island like this big noise gate where people came in and criminals became butchers and royals became uh, writers and, and, and it just let everyone get a chance to in some ways reinvent themselves or be reclassified or make decisions. Um, okay, that's a choice. It's when choice is taken away for reasons that aren't, like sometimes you have to take away choice. I get that. Like sometimes you just have to say, everyone needs to get out of this building because not to bother anyone, but it's kind of on fire. And I know you're working hard on your thesis, but you really should leave the building because we have discovered that buildings that burn down kill the people inside and you leave. There your choice is taken away for a reason. But when it's, a guy you don't know named Steven changed a two to a zero on a spreadsheet, so all your baby pictures are gone. That's a problem to me. And so I go, yeah, screw Steven. Here's your baby pictures. Now, someone might go, get your filthy hands off my baby pictures. Okay. Or someone goes, thank you for giving me the choice of having the baby pictures back. That, that's where I come from. Now, as terms of living our life in terms of looking to the past, I think the past has a lot to teach us, but it also has a lot to mislead us. People tend to create their own images in a way, you know, diaries tend to be either really depressed or really happy, depending on what the person filters for. Very few people write diaries that are cohesive. Um, only a few are. We remember them because they were good at it. But a lot of them are just, I hate myself. Why am I here? What am I doing? And then you meet them and they're like, great. It's just every night they would just kind of work out some of their anger on the thing. So we end up with a warped view of them. Um, but, but people make discoveries and people make insights and it helps us validate and understand where we are to say, wow, they felt the same thing when they when they were when they were sitting in this, you know, town or, or or there was a house here. No wonder I so at ease here. This was a house, and of course this view was beautiful. And I, I think that's that's important. I think that helps us kind of comprehend the world. And that's the one little hack that humans have that we can pass persistence from our lifetimes to other lifetimes, even if they choose to throw it out or ignore the part that says don't 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 live below this line occasionally there's a tsunami i think what was it there was the one oh, there was one community where everyone was saved because there was this one thing passed among the elders that said when the water recedes out run as fast as you can towards the to mountain the hill. Yeah. and they did and, the, and but there hadn't been anything like that in like 200 years and it was just this story of like, take care of the coconuts, you know, do some good fishing. If the water goes out, run like hell. And they did it. They listened while in communities, they tracked the maps that had huge immigrant populations where people had been cut off from their culture. They were living in spaces they had no knowledge of and the sea murdered them. So there's a, you know, there's some metaphors there. There is. So this narrative of yours, if I'm going to put it into my words, Go ahead. would be uh, giving people the, the space to make decisions for themselves what and what not should be saved for them, and you're just handing them the tools to decide whether they want to do this yes. or not. Um, it's always bad to me that beforehand doing an interview, but we did, so you also already mentioned we discussed this little thingy. Mm -hmm. Now, a big narrative um, is also guiding us to the future, no? If we think of a narrative that everybody should be uh, deciding for their own what to save or what not to save, it's a question that was not important to many people before because there were no opportunities to save everything that we could be saving. Right. Uh, and a lot of those narratives from the history, of course, were always there that we're not going to try to make you a better person, but we're going to make you fit in a better society. In what way is deciding for yourself what to save or not to save contributing to having healthier societies in future? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, 
the, the, the Norm MacDonald joke was, you know, in 50 years, people will go, hey, you want to see 100,000 pictures of my grandfather? And everything he did on every day of his life? You know, there's, there's a potential there that people are temporarily over-chronicling every single waking moment and every single meal they eat. And, and, and that they're, they're, they're going to pass not defined knowledge to, to what's next. I feel like I'm straying from your question. Um, but I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm way straying. My brain is now thinking about pictures. Redefine, redefine this question for me, because I'm, I'm the, the thing is, whenever I talk about the future, if we look at what's going on, mm. we're, oh, you're like, we're not just a little off. Like, we are always way off. Yeah. It is both, like, we will always have probably green spaces, but our relationship to those green spaces will be so far weirdly removed. Or when we have something switch over, we go from zero to it's everywhere way too fast. So we're just like, corn syrup sort of tastes like sugar. Now everything has corn syrup. And we don't even have like enough data in a generation to know what that means. Or if we put televisions in, in every single square foot of every room, because we can. Like if we add, you know, um, flexible screens, so you can just put up a television anywhere you want to and hang it, and kids will just have them like they have posters now, that's an entirely different life. Like what does that mean to people when there's nothing but this 2D visual image being pumped in from every wall, and that's all they've ever known all their life, or, or children can walk up to any screen and touch it, and the screen goes, oh, hi, how can I help you? Like, I remember when that didn't happen, but for kids who are now easily in their teens, that's never not been the case. Their perception of the world is so radically different than mine, they'll still fall in love, and they'll still laugh at many of the same things I will. But their outlook on the world and what it owes them and what they can do to it means that I can't predict their future. Okay. So I mean, that's, that's kind of where, that's, I just find I'm gonna, it. No, I'm gonna try to rephrase the question okay. once again. Um, let's say. Are you, are you with me on this? I don't know, okay. <laughs> no, because it's a, it's a tricky question actually. Yeah, it um, is. So it's the, the power of people that decide for themselves. Um, mm. Politically, one could say we have filed off a model that a lot of people call democracy, where actually it enables most people to make decisions for themselves. Yes, it has been derailed for many times, Still, I like democracies better than dictatorships because of more personal freedom for myself. Right. Now, if more people have the freedom to decide about what should be saved, you know, about internet savings, right. yeah, what would this mean for the future? Imagine everybody can have their own choice about what to save, not to save. Would it contribute to having more democratic societies where we are all able to speak out or not? That would be my question. Mm. Like, so the thing about Twitter is that Twitter reduces the level of brain activity necessary to express yourself to the world. Before the amount of effort you had to, like you can literally be sitting in a line going like, hate this line, and literally write on Twitter, hate this line, a thing that used to just kind of puff out in a little bit of neurons and then go away, or like, foot's feeling a little itchy, and you can tweet that, right? And we're experiencing the novelty of that moment. That's where we are right now. And then watching as like weird little things are happening, like we can have groups and gangs and things like that. And so there's a, there's a euphoria of chronicling. Like I can show you every meal I've eaten, or I just can take a picture with my friends every day and we'll smile and or look at this thing I'm wearing or people who were previously perhaps lonely and, and are shy can be extroverted online and, and experience that. Or, or and I mean, uh, I try to get away from being the white dude doing this, but you know, basically like, you know, having gender awareness and, and being able to speak from a voice or a minority that, is sometimes so 
oppressed that they're not even acknowledged as a phase of humanity and to be able to just build their own world in any way they want to and then be bitchy or catty about it in terms of like, well, you're not even welcome in our little world because we made it. Mm. And having that freedom to be a little weird and dumb and do it your own way. Um, that's what we're in right now. It's like this big popping euphoria. Everything can be there. Everything's going to happen. And at some point, I think people will calm down. I think it will become part of the nature. We won't chronicle everything. Um, perhaps we even might move away from more, like maybe we won't all want to take pictures of the Eiffel Tower when we see it because we know we can call up the Eiffel Tower at any time and we'll just be there. Might happen. Um, we treat people now in a way that they're encouraged to write, like I said, short sentences. That's affecting literature and that's affecting writing. Amazon's way of selling things is causing people to write shorter things to sell. So we're expressing ourselves differently. I don't... Uh, but yet, we'll have a site like The Feature or Long Form where they kind of highlight these massive essays that are researched for a year. Um, I don't think it's bad, but I think that when we get closer to you know, 10 or 20 years now that, there's, that, that there will be an internet, like the internet of today, and 10 or 20 years there's an internet or an internet-like thing, I think there's an entire set of aspects related to digital identity and digital experience that maybe will benefit from. Infinite reproducibility, the ability to make something be everywhere at once with very good fidelity. Um, the ability to ignore geography when necessary or incorporate it when needed. Um, the ability to make your own family, your own perception of a family instantly so you can become a multi-family person. I have my family of I was born here and I eat the soup. And I have my family of fellow people who feel very strongly about My Little Pony. Or I feel very strongly about we, must, we have to do something about the way the government runs in this town. And that family can exist in as high a fidelity and experience and ups and downs as we do now in personal space. So I think there's like a lot of advantages to what's going to go on. On the other hand, we are very good at homogenization and just being told, well, you get three choices of, you know, uh, soft drink and enjoy. And so, you know, it's going to be up to us to what we do with it. But again, I love that these tools, I mean, this is what I wanted since I was a child. So I've just been like, yeah, every day there's new news. Every day something's going on. The pictures are beautiful. Then would the narrative uh, rephrase again also could be um, your work is actually working to a future with more diversity and more hybridities? Well, I definitely personally don't like to be the gatekeeper for what future generations will see. I figure they're going to do it themselves. Um, so I, uh, okay, all right. So the most worthless collection, by my standards, that the, the archive team has ever grabbed, that would be the Madden Connect collection. The Madden collection is the stupidest thing we have. The Madden collection was created because there was an electronic arts feature. And in this thing, you could, you could choose which player choose what the player was doing, and then write a message. And it was just meant to be things like, go Jets, make player X from the Jets do a touchdown dance. But people quickly hijacked it and started doing things like, the patriarchy is completely misleading you, and electronic arts, and there was one of the guy going like this, and it says, electronic arts isn't very good at games. And they were just making these by the thousands. And we saved them all. It's like terabytes of animated GIFs of messages and footballers playing. I hope somebody uses that somewhere, because that was a lot of work. I mean, it, it wasn't a lot of human work, but we spent a lot of computer work. And I'm like, really? Is this happening now?
Is this what we're doing? And even, I mean, this is, the, I knew the archive team had grown up when I would like question something and they'd be like, infidel, don't even question it. Take it, save it. How dare you be against it? And I'm like, ah, okay, fine guys, you're right. Once they took one, once they downloaded an entire site and never told me and attached it to another project. It was, uh, I have a picture of myself shedding a tear. I'm like, they've all grown up. They had to hide from me that it was being saved because they were worried I was going to say no. I'm the stopgap. I'm the friction to that. I'm in the way. I will be turned into the, uh, I'll be turned into the soil that they will grow their seeds of their generation in. And so it was very inspiring because some of them have really taken the core values of what I was talking about and they're building their own identities with it and they run things on their own. And so I never thought I'd be that way. I never had kids. So I never thought that I would pass on things like that. So to me, it's been great. You know, they're angry children, but they're oh, great no, children. No, no, I think because we're gonna to get to very Sunday-ish um, sermon style and, and personal stuff that perhaps you don't wanna have people streamed. So I'm gonna look onto you and see whether there's any among you would like to pose a question or <coughs> as this is the final night, share an essay that actually should not be shared, but still you wanna comment on it because it's the end of the festival. The guy in the magic hat there's wants a, to hear from you. There's a few girls with the, the microphones on the side. So there was a hand right up right there. Song. Okay. Hi, Jason. Hello. Um, first, I just want to say thank you because I th I think that the 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 work in archiving you're doing, um, I'm not sure how it's being articulated now. What uses, what function is actually having now? But I can really envision it being a really um, a really beneficial space for research today and in the future, especially to understand sort of the cultural nuances um, of the things that you're capturing. So it's a really fantastic project. Um, and, and I think a lot of people in the future, especially, yeah, definitely in the future, will be very thankful for it. Um, but I have uh, two quick questions. Sure. Uh, the first question is basically based on the uh, language question that you asked, uh, Friso, which is um, we, we, we talk about the internet as being this sort of global phenomenon, but, it, but it's actually not. The internet is very much Western-centric in both hardware and operationally in, in virtual space. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and the reason I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this is when we consider the versions of archiving throughout history, there have been many versions of history that have been written also from a Western-centric framework. Um, and we, we, you've been talking a lot about, you know, what will people 100 years from now say um, about culture today? Um, do, do you have any thoughts that in a hundred years they'll look back at our digital culture today and only see a lens of a Western culture? Especially under the guise that the internet is a global phenomenon. So that, that's kind of the first question. And, and just the second one really quickly is what do you do with the hardware once you actually digitize it? Okay. The second one is I keep it as long as I can, store it in plastic, do my best. Um, so that's, that's what that question, I mean, I'm, I, I, I believe that when you digitize, you should destroy the original just because it, you know, it just has proven that it, it, it gets better and better. I do now buy into kind of the philosophy of what the archive does. Um, we digitize about 1000 books a day and the way we do it is we take two photographs of the pages and the reason that's not perfect is because you really want to do a full, you know, high DPI scan, but you don't know which ones need that. Like if you have a page out of a, a romance novel and it's 25 or 45 um, lines of text that tell you that her the button was flying off her dress, um, that's all you need. Like the typography is vaguely interesting, but you don't need it to be rendered and it's expensive. But in the future, someone might go, no, it actually turns out that this was a special approach to printing and we want to get the perfect font because for some reason they use this, you know, a thing you can't imagine. And then they'll want to go back to those pages and do it right. But the, the approach of do it well, okay, non-destructively, and then revisit it again, if you can, non-destructively, 
is a more economic approach. But in all these cases, when they destroy the objects, uh, you're, uh, to me, that, especially when it's unnecessary, they had to destroy the last, one of the last prints of Trip to the Moon to restore it because the, the film had fused and they, they basically took the film and ran acid on it for a year so that a, a, thing, a frame would come off, they would photograph it as much as they could and it would dissolve, and that's how they restored it, because that was the only way to do it. Okay, but you don't have to do that for most things. Um, the first question, um, okay, so right now, like usual, Africa's getting the short shrift. Uh, like usual, um, a, a lot of, of, of women are getting the short shrift, and like usual, an awful lot of non-technology uh, absorbing societies are getting the short shrift. So if we allow it to become dominant that internet culture defines what culture was, yeah. Like in the same way that if we define, um, if we only allow Victorian literature of the time to be the only literature that shows human reaction, then you'll be like, wow, they sure had a lot of tea parties and they sure dressed a lot and it was very bad to dishonor somebody. Like that becomes your lens and they're selling them in the street. Um, in the same way, digitization equipment is now a fraction of what it was. Um, easily, and it won't be perfect, but if somebody recognizes, wow, that's important. Um, I mean, I can make a pledge that, I mean, I don't, I never ever turn away from someone and saying, we need your help, and me going, well, who needs to hear from you? Or, well, I don't know how important this is. Um, um, I almost want to give the example. There was a community that we archived. I'm not even going to glorify them by telling you who they are. And every time I dealt with these guys, I was just like, you are disgusting. But we did it. And I was like, I don't get to make their choice of their persistence and immortality. They are part of the mosaic of what we were. And if I decide we can't have them, they don't get on the ship, then who, where else do I go with that, right? Oh, communists, who needs that? Oh, uh, you know, feminist blog, eh, complaining, I don't want it. And you just start to get stupid, and then you end up with, essentially, tech crunch. Or um, wires. Is this an, enough of an answer to your question? Or was it the case of you asked for a sentence and I gave you a novel and you're like, thanks, I guess? <laughs> Let's see who else in the room has a question here. Hello. Uh, thank you for uh, your inspiring talk. Um, I am uh, an assist assistant uh, researcher at Utrecht University dealing with uh, new media and privacy. And I'm uh, very curious about how you guys uh, deal with those issues because I can imagine that sometimes you rip a website that um, is uh, well corporately owned and I, I fully agree that um, the contents if they are made by users should be in their uh, are their property um, have you ever dealt with people that don't want their content to be on your site I mean users and so not so much corporations but uh, users themselves and and uh, content that's dealing with that, their identity. Did, did we, what was that, three questions before the copyright question? Well, I think actually, that was. the question is, have any personal users, or not the corporations that right. rule the sites, have they have objections to their stuff being published? Right. I you? mean, I mean, absolutely, when you run an operation like that, uh, it pulls up the relationship of what people do. And... Um, I mean, I can give you the pithy answer, or I can give you the other answer, but I mean, like, there was a, there was a, there was a web community, or I should say an online site called, um, um, oh wow, how am I? It was the Internet Underground Music Archive, Ayuma. And it was started in 1993, 
It was so new that it saved things in MP3, AU, and Wave because they didn't know which one was going to win. Um, they became a website. They gathered, gathered I think, ultimately 45,000 bands. They were sold off in 2000 and then slowly choked to death until they were deleted in 2006, and taking out all of the music. And um, somebody saved as much of it as they could and handed me a four millimeter tape in 2011. And we put them all back up again. 350,000 songs from 45,000 bands, some of whom didn't know that was going to happen. Many who didn't, probably to this day, don't know it's all back. The original creator of Ayuma aimed the domain name back at our collection. So if you were to go to that URL, it would go back to a collection of them. And we've had, out of the 45,000, probably 200 to 300 bands. It might be as many as 400 say no. And their reasons are very different. Um, the, re the, the dominant reason... I swear to God, this is the dominant reason, is we get a message from Dan Miller, um, CPA, and he says, you need to take down everything from the Flaming Fucks. And we go to the Flaming Fucks, and Mr. Miller was the bassist and doesn't want to, anyone to know that he was a bassist for the Flaming Fucks because he's now Dan Miller, CPA, 37, living in the city. And so, believe it or not, a lot of them are just like that. I was, I was 18. What was I thinking? Take it down. And so we make it inaccessible to the public. A small number say you have the demo version of our for sale album, and you are a very good match. So we would prefer that the for sale album that we really refined, um, stay stay dominant. So over time, people have pulled them down. And then other times people have come and gone, what miracle did you do? Like, I, the one that really touched me was there was a, a duo who did music together and one of them got sick and died. And the family of the one who died never approved of this and didn't approve that he was gay and didn't approve any of it. So they destroyed everything of his. So this partner who had worked with him had none of their music and we brought it all back. All the songs came back online. And he, he was just saying, oh my God, it's like my friend's alive again. Because I, I haven't heard the songs in 15, 20 years because of what you did. And so that's great. I mean, we bring that history back. Um, but we respect what people want to do. We just understand that it's too, it's too hard to look at a million accounts and ask for permission a million times. And that it's just better to be a nonprofit, obviously be a library, not put ads next to it, put it up, and then be told occasionally, yeah, okay, I don't need people to see my old Black Sabbath fan page. Okay, and we take it off of access. Jack, quite an answer to your question. Yeah. I'm gonna be looking at you to see whether there's one final question in the room. If there is not, no, wait, this, this there dude, is okay. Ion himself. Well, him actually behind him, the dude behind you had a two okay. questions. Yeah, yeah. Make me regret it. Make me regret giving you this choice. Yes, I will. I Bring it on. Will. Do you see a limit to where uh, the tentacles of Google can go? Do I see limits? I no. Mean, no. Look what they just did with Alphabet. They basically said, everything you think you'd be uncomfortable Google doing, we will now do. That's what they basically said. Anything that businesses would go, why is Google doing lenses that can detect glucose level? Now it's under alphabet. It's totally allowed. Now Google's a, no, no, it's a monster. It's going to be amazing what they do. They're going to be in everything. They're going to be, I mean, we've had companies like this before. Um... Cisco comes to mind, sorry, S-Y-S-C-O is an industrial firm. Um, I feel like Krupp has some of that aspect too. Uh, Honda has some of that aspect. That ability to just kind of envelop into every direction as pertains to maybe we'll make some money on it and speculative investment and, and getting involved in industries you can't even believe they're in. 
I think Google will just do the same thing, especially when they're this entrenched right now, making this much money off internet. That uh, no, they're good luck, man. Google lunches, Google Fiber, Google wood paneling, Google schools, Google eye replacement surgery, Google health, Google whatever. Oh yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Oh yeah, it's gonna be good times. So that's well, my take. There we are then. Ayon, final question to you.、Um, yeah. Well, as we know, a, a major part what people、uh, of the traffic on the internet, sorry, a major part of the traffic on the internet and what people store is porn.、Um, I haven't seen a single slide or reference to porn in your presentation. I'm wondering what's the policy of archive.org on porn.、Um, what is the policy? Do you like, store it like you would store like, any? We're for、material? it. <laughs> um, um, we have stored. We do have a large amount of adult materials. Um, we just implemented. Let's put. Let me, sorry, this is this is actually getting to my my work level.、Um, we are rolling out tests of a flagging system to enable people to in indicate that there might be graphic, violent, or sexual content, and people who choose to be flagged to warn be warned of it. Can then be told hey, before you sit there, dude's head's coming off, or there's going to be some boobs, or whatever, and it will warn them. It'll say people notice that a lot of people who have looked at this can't help but notice the breasts, and and then have them respond. So I mean, it's it's trying to keep items up and available to those who wish to have it, but also to allow. People the ability to curate their own experience. So、um, we have a large collection of beautiful stag films from the 1960s,、um, uh, and we do have.、Uh, I have an adult film history archive that's working with me now, that might put some materials up.、Um, you know, old flyers of burlesque shows and film loops and stuff. You know, they haven't figured out what they want, but we'll we'll take it. So. No, I mean, and the adult video games, all set there.、Um, we also try to—I mean, I tried to move them into a mature section as people point them out to me. You did see one little piece of porn because I left it up there in the ZX Spectrum section. There was a strip poker on the corner, right? Yeah, yeah there was one. Gotcha. <laughs> That's quite an ender for this thing. Porn. Yup. Well, and with those famous words, I think. We're going to be giving a big round of applause to Jason Scott. Thanks again to everyone for hosting me. By the way, the the team here has been. I mean, I, you, you know, you have that regret. You come in and you're like, "Oh, I'm only going to stay with your friend for like one night. I'm not comfortable staying with my friend." And you go there and you're like, "Oh my God, this guy's amazing. I wish we could spend all day tomorrow." And I'm like. I'm really sad my plane leaves at 9:30 tomorrow morning, because I'm like these people ran everything. I mean, you ran everything beautifully. I mean, all the it was like it was like just a stellar staff. I mean, people here don't maybe don't get to quite experience that entire thing, but they were right there. Everybody had an answer. Everybody could find something for me. I don't see that as often in conferences. A lot of conferences are like, we made the room work. We're done here, and. Uh, stellar staff, so so I've just it's, I regret that there aren't two of me, so that one of me could have come here on Thursday. <laughs> Which <laughs> thereby thanking you、um, as a defender of the rights of people to curate their own experiences, and then I would like to call forward Ayon and Kate Ilga for the final words here in this lecture room before we all. Have a sad goodbye in here, and、uh, going to have plenty of drinks upstairs. Yeah, it, it's over. Ilga has a cold. I'm starting to get a headache. I think the past <laughs> few days, past few months, I may say, have taken their toll.、Um, but it's been a wonderful experience for us, thanks to guests like you, Jason, and all the other guests that we've had here. Ilga, maybe you want to say something. Yes.、Yeah, so my、um, both my both my.、Um, Internal and my external memories are crumbling. As you can see, I feel、um, not so bad as I look. So I'm just going to sum up 
um, some of the some of the I think surprisingly interesting issues that we raised um, in non chronological non hierarchical order. Um, so I hope that uh, some of you can make sense out of that. Um, we've seen Snowden versus the disappeared Malaysia Airlines Boeing. We've seen the flat platformization of the web, obfuscation, analog thinking versus digital methods, vertical monopolies, correlation does not equal causality, public false consciousness, and creative resistance. And in all the questions that we've been trying to ask with the, with, with the issues in the future of the past, in a world well documented, how will memory function in an age of massive data capture? We don't have the answer after five days, to be very honest. Uh, we have uh, more questions though. Uh, will we in the future have 15 minutes of invisibility? How does the right to be forgotten meet Jason Scott's a team, you live only once. Do we need legislation for servers? Um, and perhaps is history still written by the winners? So, um, well, the only thing I can end on is uh, a quote by Cecil B. Evans um, saying, now it's the future, but head. Um, Jason already uh, did us a little bit uh, what we also should do is mm. uh, thanking our team and all mm. the people that uh, worked on this festival. Um, yeah, I'm glad they were good to you. I think they've been good to all of us. Uh, technicians of Kicker, I would like to thank you a lot for helping us out, even in the difficult moments sometimes. Uh, the bar, uh, people beyond the bar of Kicker. Um, I'm not going to mention any names because I'm sure I'm so tired I would mistake <laughs> and make mistakes. Um, so. Please, a uh, warm round of applause for our team and all our volunteers. Yes, please. I'm not sure how long the bar will be open, but we are ending earlier, <laughs> earlier than we would normally do on a Sunday. So I would uh, uh, enjoy having a drink with all of you in the bar. I think it will be open for sure until 11. Um, so um, thanks for attending. Last thing though, um, we've, been, we've been collecting some of the pixels and the bytes, not only in text and in um, poor writing in little notebooks, but also in video bytes. So I'd also like to thank uh, Peter and Remco for documenting uh, this festival on a very uh, basic level that will be, and Klaas Hille, sorry, also. Don't we've done, class. Uh, we've done uh, video bytes, we've been uh, tweeting, we've been um, posting on Facebook. Uh, I hope you did streaming. Everything here. Everything happened here, you can go to our website, it's there on stream, we will edit the material, you can look it back, um, uh, more, more interesting things to enjoy there. And maybe one day we will end up with this entire festival dealing with the future of the memory, uh, the f well, basically yes, uh, in the Utrecht archive, um, who knows, we're going to work on uh, a lot of things for the next year. Uh, to come and we hope that you keep an eye out on us uh, and our exciting programs for the upcoming year as well. Thank you all for attending several programs, many of you. Thank you, Arjun. It was a blast again. Thank you, Ilga. <laughs> so, uh, yes, warm round of applause for everybody for attending. Thank you.